I'm Dana Denha, and you're watching FYI. Every day we celebrate nations throughout the world with the food we eat, the clothes we wear, and the entertainment we enjoy. And now in Ann Arbor, you can get immersed in Chinese culture by signing up for classes at the Taiwan Center for Mandarin Learning. We are cutting the ribbon and celebrating the grand opening of the Taiwan Center for Mandarin Language. We want to establish in this Ann Arbor country as, as a best option if you want to know the traditional Mandarin culture. It's impossible to miss the fact that Ann Arbor is already home to a large Taiwanese American population. We have a lot of Mandarin speakers here. Uh, but also, I think that as we look towards the future, uh, Mandarin is such an important language internationally. Uh, it, it would give people uh, who learn Mandarin so many tools and so many additional uh, opportunities to communicate with people around the world, make connections. We, we're hoping in that exchanging of ideas that we can synergize some sort of basic a new path for language learning. Let's continue to build those connections between uh, Taiwan and between Ann Arbor. Spray the word. <laughs> Sign up today at tcml-annarbor.org. Stay tuned, and we'll be back with more in exactly 30 seconds. Being involved in sports at a young age promotes physical fitness, self-control, and determination. And the NFL, along with universities throughout the country, are reaching inner-city youth through football. The Youth Impact Program welcomed 10 to 14-year-olds to Michigan Stadium, merging football with math, science, and life skills. They're learning academics in the first half of the day, and then they're learning uh, football and different football skills in the second half of the day. It's combining these and it's also uh, under the element of discipline. So it's really uh, preparing them for football, for academics. It has so many elements to it. It's not just football, not just rolling out a ball and it's not great football instruction, how to throw the ball, how to catch the ball. These are life changing types of experiences. In the morning, for the entire morning, it's strictly academic. Reading, writing, math, science. The program utilizes public school teachers, the Marines, and NCAA and NFL coaches. They're transferring their skills from the football field to the classroom. and It's really helping them because they know that they have to stay focused. Basically, the Marines here are to make sure that the kids are following the instructions. We, make, we get them from point A to point B, and we, we try to do that as quickly as possible uh, while also instilling discipline. It has to do with, with how you live your life. You know, waking up in the morning with that enthusiasm unknown to mankind. I'm going to make this day better than yesterday and I'm going to make tomorrow better today. And it isn't just athletics or football, and it's life. I want to be better at life. School bells are ringing, and that means safety on our roads is a priority. Between school buses, crosswalks, and the influx of pedestrians, our roadways can get congested fast. Learn more about back-to-school safety in this month's City Roundup in 60. Hi everyone, I'm Officer Jamie Atkins with the Ann Arbor Police Department. It's that time of year again. It's time for kids to go back to school. Here are some basic traffic safety tips we should all remember. First of all, be alert, especially when you're in school zones, and be alert of the speed and make sure you obey that speed limit. Also, watch for school buses. 
Red flashing lights and an extended stop arm mean that that bus is stopping to load or unload children. We have 19 different locations across the city that are staffed with crossing guards. They help cross our children and get them safely to school. If you see a crossing guard in the intersection with their stop sign held up, make sure you stop and wait until that crossing guard has cleared out of the intersection. Don't block crosswalks. If you're stopped at a red light, waiting to turn or looking for a parking space, make sure that you steer clear of the crosswalk so that people don't have to walk around your vehicle and possibly put themselves into moving traffic. Remember folks, it's our job to keep kids safe as we go back to school this fall. Thanks everybody for watching and parents, I hope you have a great and safe start to your school year. Ann Arbor is a unique place to live with so much to experience, but one of the best aspects of living in the city is the gem that is the Ann Arbor District Library. The AADL is so much more than a place to find books. It's a meeting room. There's any number of items available for checkout, a venue to stay in the know, just to name a few. Joining me is Eli Nyberger, Director of the Ann Arbor District Library. Welcome to the show, Eli. Hello, Dana. Thank you for having me. Uh, you know, first, let's talk about your history with the Ann Arbor District Library. You were, you've were you been at the library for a long time. That's right. Yeah, I joined the library as a help desk technician in August of 1997, and I've been here ever since. So I worked in the IT department for a long time. I was IT manager for several years. Uh, I've been deputy director since 2014. So I worked a lot with our former director, Josie, uh, for years and years. And uh, now I've been director since April, and it's just an amazing opportunity. I'm so delighted to have the uh, this amazing organization to work with and to be a part of every day. Was this sort of like your dream job to get once Josie was leaving? Um, I mean, not necessarily. You know, it's it's like I certainly uh, I love this organization. I didn't want to go anywhere else, and. Um, uh, you know, I was already sort of in the position of, of being involved with a lot of the administration and Josie and I worked together very closely. So it was a uh, it was a great opportunity to just sort of have continuity for the organization, continuity for the community. Uh, but, you know, my degree was in architecture and I started out in IT and it certainly wasn't like uh, thinking of library administration. But by the time the opportunity arose, I couldn't envision doing anything else. Sure. Yeah. I mean, especially when you're there since 97 and just sort of working your way around. <laughs> We got a we got a visitor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, well, the discussion you know, of libraries always brings out the cats. Yes, <laughs> I'm sure cats love books uh, getting in the shelves. You know, talk about obviously Josie had some big shoes to fill. I'm sure working with her help. But, you know, you've been on the job for less than a year, a lot less than a year at this point. Uh, talk about filling those shoes and sort of replacing someone that was a mainstay at the library for so long. And at the same time, you recently before her, you lost Tim Grimes, who was a big part of the library, too. Yeah, you know, it's um, uh. Certainly, Josie's mark on the library uh, will endure for a very long time. You know, she built all of the branches. Uh, we worked on Westgate. You know, there was all of the sort of growth of the library happened during Josie's 20 years as director. And a lot of the growth of our events program happened under Tim's. You know, Tim worked here for 20 plus years as well. So it was a, uh, a team that we've, and I think really the continuity is a part of why the organization has been so successful over the years, is that uh, we're not often bringing in new leadership that then needs to make their own mark. Uh, we have an internal culture of excellent library service, and everyone's really on the same page and working to make things happen as best as we can for the community, uh, take good use of the resources with which we've been entrusted, and make sure that we are developing a library that is accessible to everyone. It's really a testament to the library that so many people stay for so long. I mean, you've been there for a long time. Everyone seems to stay for a couple decades at least, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's definitely a place that once you start working here, it's not very common that you move on somewhere else. It's a pretty special <laughs> place. We'll talk about these first few months on the job, what it's been like, and what, what you sort of hope to see as you move forward with the position. So, you know, we're still sort of uh, transitioning out of a very unusual period for us. Uh, you know, we were closed entirely uh, for a couple of months during the early part of the pandemic. And then we had our vestibule service for over a year uh, in 2020 to 2021. And now we're just sort of like bringing all that back and slowly a uh, step at a time, adding more events, uh, more people coming back to the library. 
there's some services that we started during the pandemic that are still operating. And, you know, at the same time, the pandemic's not over. And we are very aware of that. It's an organization that is very uh, evidence-based. We take things very seriously. And we want to make sure that everyone in the community, regardless of their personal health situation, is welcome in the library. So really continuing to still take public health as seriously as we can from a public library perspective. And then just continuing to grow the services. You know, in many cases, people have been asking me, well, what are you going to do? Well, I've been doing it. You know, we've been doing a lot of stuff here together for many years. So there really, I don't have a list of things that Josie was saying no to or anything like that, right? We were able to do a lot of things together and it's just sort of continuous growth. One thing that we recently launched uh, that we've been working on for a long time is reservations for our lawn games and large tools. So you can now go to aedl.org slash book a tool and you can actually reserve the lighting kits or the large lawn games or a PA or a projector for an event on a specific day, which is not really the way that library collections usually operate. So it's great for us to be in a situation to be able to uh, support weddings and graduation parties and all kinds of gatherings that uh, we really never thought would be a major part of library service. But as soon as we introduced that mega chest to the collection, it was like the hot item for weddings. So we needed to have a way to facilitate. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, you talk, you talk to anyone when you're at any sort of gathering. I went to a school barbecue thing and they were like, oh, we're so lucky to get the connect, the large connect four from the library. And people are just really psyched about this stuff. And I think it just opens the door to so much more at the library where you're not having to be there. You just get these things that would actually probably cost a lot of money if you had to rent them from somewhere for a cost. Right. And that was, you know, for millennia, the primary economic value of libraries was that books were expensive and rare. And now we're in a period when books aren't quite as expensive and not very rare at all. And we will continue to have print books at the Ann Arbor Library as long as people are coming to check them out. And that is continues to go. There's strong demand for books in the community. We're not in any uh, sort of concern about that. But it's a good opportunity for us to diversify the value of the library, use the mechanisms that we have in place to do the same economic role that we played for books when they were rare and expensive. Well, now a giant Connect Four is rare and expensive and it's you can't get it anywhere else. And it's much better when libraries are in a position to provide services to the community that it can't get anywhere else, as opposed to duplicating services that are very parallel to things in the commercial sector. So we find that our resources make the most bang for the buck when we're get, giving things to people that they can't get anywhere else. Have you seen a change in what, you know, people are checking out? I You see a lot of, like, in my neighborhood alone, you see a ton of those, like, little libraries that people just, like, get rid of their books and exchange them for other books. Yeah. Is, have you seen a change in the library because of that? You know, print demand is one of the things that we've seen change the least. Uh, there's a much bigger change in demand for AV because of streaming services. Like, demand for CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays are, are continuing to fall year over year, which is what we would expect. But we, at the same time, have a lot of items on our shelves that are on no streaming service at all. So that is becoming sort of, again, a unique value, something people can't get anywhere else, where there's movies that people want to watch that are on no platforms, but they're right here in your community, right? and it's on the shelf. You just got to come in and pick it up or even just request it online. We'll hold it for you. But overall, I, um, I think in many ways what's happening with Little Free Libraries uh, is really evidence of the sort of the glut of print materials that exist in in our communities, there's a lot more print materials than there's demand for them overall. So that's great because then the value of them collapses very low to the point where people are willing to just give them away freely, which is terrific because it's so, so great for people to be able to share their stuff and have uh, materials available all over the community uh, that is outside the commercial world. I like that you mentioned, you know, uh, about the technology aspect about getting DVDs and Blu-rays and stuff, because I can think of an instance where I took my daughter to the library and we checked out Flintstone Kids, which was a show that I watched when I was a kid. And you can't, you could not watch that anywhere. It might show up as like a thing that exists, but you couldn't right. find it anywhere. And then we yeah, were like, you know, the song and all this stuff. It was so fun. Yep. My kids are a little older and I wanted them to see Better Off Dead, who's a great movie from the 80s that is on zero streaming services, but it was just sitting on the shelf. And I went down and I grabbed it and we watched it. And it has kind of held up well. It's still got some good jokes, but uh, parts of it have definitely not held up as well. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, and so the library has a podcast and stuff. Now you have like a nice podcast studio. Is that? Yeah, we have a podcasting studio. Oh, during the pandemic, we remodeled one of our uh, meeting rooms up on the fourth floor, built the studio that we'd been looking to build for a long time. And now we have a service that we're building around that called Fifth Avenue Studios. Uh, and that you can pitch us your podcast. Uh, you can come use the room uh, if you already have an existing podcast. We also can, when we do a podcast in partnership with uh, someone who has an idea, we can help with the infrastructure of it, put it on our website, the distribution getting it into iTunes, those kinds of things. And that's a, a pitch process. So you can go, you can uh, find us online, Fifth Avenue Studios, submit your idea. And if it's something that the library is interested in working with you on, we can help uh, not just with podcasts, but also with music. We have some musicians who are using the studio, uh, also spoken word things that aren't exactly podcasts. So there's a lot of opportunity for people to create their own materials, which again is a role that libraries have played for centuries. You know, that was a place for scholars to go, go do writing. And uh, increasingly, a quiet room is a, uh, uh, a very valuable resource for the community. So we're happy to be able to get that rolling. And we've had some great projects come out of there already. So are you assisting people with the equipment in the room? How does that work? There's a couple different levels, depending on what people are looking for and how far uh, the library is going to support it. And at its very least, we just uh, allow the room to be booked and people can come in and use the room with their own equipment. Sort of like the next step is we will do some assistance getting them started. And then like at the top end, when we're producing a partnership podcast is we'll actually engineer the podcast. We'll have library staff handle the recording and the distribution and things like that. But it depends on how far people have gone with it, what help we can really provide. As you know, it's nice to do that, but you don't really need any of that to make a good podcast. You can really make a pretty great podcast with a telephone. So it's a uh, opportunity that we can provide when it's the right project, when it's the right fit. And we've got a couple really cool projects going on right now. And you just reserve that room. Is that how it works? Well, you contact us through Fifth Avenue Studios. Tell us about your project. It's not like an openly bookable resource yet. We may get there after we have a little bit more experience supporting people using the room. You mentioned earlier that, you know, obviously you guys were closed for a while. You had to sort of shift your services and now you're sort of back in person, but it's a mix. And you said some of those services you were keeping, what, for example, what is still happening at the library that you kept sure. because of the pandemic? So there's two things that in particular we developed during the pandemic that we're continuing to operate. Uh, one is a service we call shelf service, which is during the time that we were open for pickups only, one of the things was that people couldn't browse the shelves. So if you didn't know what you wanted, uh, we didn't, it wasn't as easy to use the library. So we uh, started a service where you can tell us what sort of things you're looking for, what type of age or interest of reader uh, you're looking for, and that our staff would go fill a bag of stuff and it would be ready for checkout for you. And that was a very popular service, particularly for parents who may not have a particular title in mind. They just want a bag full of books to read to their kid. And uh, that's something we're still doing and we don't see any need to discontinue that. So you can still request, it's just at aadl.org slash shelf service. Tell us what you're looking for and our staff will fill a bag of books. That's just what you're looking for or DVDs or magazines or whatever you're looking for. And that'll just be ready for you to pick up. The other thing that we started doing is uh, offering a printing service. Uh, so you can go to aadl.org slash printing and you can upload a document or give us a URL. We'll actually print it out for you for free and have it waiting for you on the shelf when you come to pick it up. That was something that we started doing again when we couldn't allow people to come in and use the printers. But it's been such a useful service, you know, especially for people who are tired of trying to run a printer in their own home. Uh, it's you, you can just upload your file or send us a link and we'll print it out. And it's generally waiting for you on the hold shelf the next weekday. So those are two examples of services we started during the pandemic that we plan to continue. And, you know, it's, it's a, a very sort of patron driven where these were services that continued because patrons were using them and there was not really a cause to discontinue. Yeah, I mean, that printing service is a great idea. I haven't had a printer in my home at all. And since I've lived in this house, I've not had a printer. And other than like, if it's a work document, I'll go to work to print it. But sometimes you just have like one thing that you just like right. need printed and you don't want to have a yeah. printer in your house. So especially yeah, at the downtown library, we print a lot of boarding, boarding passes and shipping labels and things like that. Yeah, yeah sure. 
do you guys offer like uh downloadable stuff so can you download music uh books things like that yeah we have a lot of stuff like that that you can download in a in addition to our ebook collection, which is through the Libby app or Overdrive app, uh, we also have a lot of materials that we license directly that you can find directly in our catalog. Downloads is one of your choices you can search from. And those are things that you can download and actually keep. Uh, there's no checkout. There's no return. There's no waiting. We have music. We have streaming video in that system. We have a lot of uh, stuff that we've licensed from the BBC, nature documentaries, Jane Austen, literary adaptations, lots of materials like that. Uh, documentaries uh, about from other film producers as well, and a lot of music. We have uh, made a deal many years ago with Ghostly Records uh, when they were still here in Ann Arbor. And uh, so most of the Ghostly's catalog as of that time is in our in our collection for immediate download or streaming. You can listen to it all day. So there's a lot of digital content just available from the library that we've licensed directly. And that's all right in our download section. So you can go to aedl.org slash downloads, or you can you can just search by choosing downloads when you from the drop down. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, uh, stuff that you're not having to pay for and you get to keep. I mean, what a great service. I the library well, you already paid so for much. it. There's nothing free about the library. You just paid in advance. Yeah, sure. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things that the library always does that I think is just so great is that they're always available at, you know, when there's events happening. We just went to the Rolling Sculpture Car Show. There's a tent there for the kids. Why does the library always want to be there available and sort of known to the community? And it's always something great for the kids because a lot of times these events aren't necessarily aimed towards your children, but it gives them something to do then while you're there. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we found through our own surveys that we reach about 80% of the households in Ann Arbor, but 100% of the households in Ann, Arbor, in Ann Arbor pay for the library. So we would really like to try to reach as many households as we can. And when you go to those outdoor events, you always have the chance of meeting someone who doesn't currently use the library and turning them into a library user. And, you know, when you reach as deeply into the community as we do, you got to work really hard for every new user. So being out at all those events, there's always the chance we'll find someone and make a library user out of them. And uh, the other part of it, like you said, we always want to be valuable to the families in our community. While libraries are not like exclusively kid-oriented organizations, we always want to make sure that people that are that are young or growing up library users, because that's really the main determinant, right? If someone uses a library as an adult, is how they felt about using the library as a kid. And we know that the kids who grow up as AADL patrons are going to be lifelong library users because we've established for them that the library is here for them and that it's going to meet them where they are and give them things they're interested in. And that's just part of going out to the community events where already the community is coming to the event and we can show them that we're interested in what they're interested in. You know, what's in scope for the public library? Only the entirety of human culture, right? So everything is in scope for the public library. So there's really no event that it doesn't make sense for us to uh, send some staff out to table, distribute some materials, have some fun things to do, and reach the audience of that event where they already are. And as a parent of a young kid, I suggest going to your library. It's so fun. There's always something for the kids to play with there. And like you said, that service that you offer where when I look for kid books at the library, I don't know what I'm looking for. So either you could take advantage of that service or you go there and your kid sort of hangs out and gets to know the library and then you pick books and you're like, hey, does this look good to you? It's just like a fun thing to do. It's like a fun activity to do with your kids. Yeah. And a great way to have the shopping experience in a non-commercial context. Totally. Because you really get to, there's really no limit. You can take home 200 things if you want to. It's just a matter of if you can carry them home and then bring them all back. Well, you mentioned earlier that you're sort of getting back into doing events in person at the library. Are you doing a mix? Are you doing virtual and in-person events at the library? Yeah, we're still doing a mix. Um, you know, there's some things that really only make sense in person, like craft events and things like that. Although in many of the cases, we do distribute a kit of, of supplies and make a video about how to do it at home. You know, every family has a different assessment of their personal risk in this time. And we want to make sure that we have something for everybody, whether they are not overly concerned about the risk of being around other families or whether they're very concerned about still the risk of being around other families. So we have that in both cases where uh, we still are producing a lot of events on our YouTube channel. You know, over the course of the pandemic, we produced thousands of online events. 
And we're still doing some. And some events actually work better in that format. You know, we never had a lot of great uh, participation in in-person book discussions. And part of it is because an in-person book discussion is very susceptible to the people who show up. Uh, and if someone shows up and wants to dominate the conversation, it's pretty hard to stop them. But on Zoom, you got that magic little mute button. So it's really <laughs> much easier to have a successful book discussion on Zoom than it is in person because you have ability to control all types of patron behavior, which is always part of library service, uh, to make for a better experience. So yeah, we, we have not stopped producing video events. Certainly the volume is down compared to when we weren't doing any in-person events because it's the same staff doing them. But we see that video events will continue to be a part of the mix for quite some time. And are you guys still producing the pulp so people can sort of stay in the know about what events to go check out and whatnot? Absolutely. A2pulp.org. That's our, our arts blog. Uh, we started that some years ago, uh, and it's basically the prominent sort of news coverage for arts events in the community at this point. Uh, it's updated multiple times a week. Uh, a big favorite is a Friday Five. Every Friday, we highlight five new Washtenaw County music artists. A lot of times, some of those artists are getting their first ever sort of coverage. And uh, so it's it's a great way to sort of find out what's going on in the community and get things that aren't covered elsewhere in the media. Well, before we go, we're just about out of time, but why don't you tell people, you know, you said there's that 20% of people that don't utilize the library, why people should take advantage of the Ann Arbor District Library, which I think is like no library I've ever lived near. There's just, like I said, there's so much to offer. You can't even imagine all the things available. That's exactly right. And I think that there's, you know, our key value proposition is, like I said earlier, you already paid for it. You should probably use it. And it's more than you can imagine. There's, of course, we got lots of books and lots of DVDs and lots of movies and lots of magazines. But we also have things you'd never have ever expected to find in the library, like a theremin or a sewing machine or a T-Rex skeleton or all kinds of different items that you might like to try, take home. And the other thing about it is while the library is a government entity, we don't provide the customer service that people usually expect from government entities. So ask us what you're looking for. Ask us for help. We're responsive via text, via email, via phone. We're always available to the community. And I think that when you ask the library for what you're looking for, you're going to have a great experience. And that's due to our amazing staff working every day to try to help everybody have a great experience using their public library. Well, I want to thank you for being on the show, Eli, and I want to congratulate you on your new position. Thank you very much, Dana. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having us on and uh, look forward to talking to you again in the future. For more on this and other programs, visit a2gov.org slash ctn. Visit youtube.com slash ctn Ann Arbor to see all that we have to offer. And remember to like, subscribe, and ring that notification. Thanks for watching and tune in next time to FYI. Mm -hmm.